Askawikwasan, as we stand here in this place and give thanksgiving for Nukasakiana, our Earth Mother, we must acknowledge that the original inhabitants of this place, the Naha Hagansik, still remain here. In the past, we gave thanksgiving. We were stewards of this place, for it gives us life. As we remain here today, survivors of oppression and attempted genocide, we still give great thanks for this land, for it is our mother, our keeper, our provider. In exchange for the gifts that Mother Earth gives us, we must give back so we continue to be stewards of this place. Ninaj. Good evening. My name is Julianne Stelmazic, and I'm the Director of Food Strategy for the State of Rhode Island. In my role, I serve Rhode Islanders in helping to build a more resilient, sustainable, and regional food system. In 2017, the state launched its first ever food vision, known as Relish Roti, which strives to grow our local food economy, protect our working lands and waters for future generations, and celebrates the unique food and cultures of our state. As someone who started my own food journey as a young farmer in Massachusetts, I'm truly honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Leah Penniman, a black Creole farmer, author, mother, and food justice activist who's been tending the soil and organizing for an anti-racist food system for 25 years. Leah has been farming since 1996, both here in New England and internationally, with farmers in Ghana, Haiti, and Mexico. In 2008, Leah co-founded Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York, a 72-acre Afro-Indigenous-centered community farm committed to uprooting racism in the food system. As co-ed and farm director, Leah facilitates powerful food sovereignty programs, including farmer training for black and brown people, a subsidized farm food distribution program for communities living under food apartheid, and domestic and international organizing towards equity in the food system. She's also the author of Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farms Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land. And next year, she'll publish a new book, Black Earth Wisdom, Soulful Conversations with Black Environmentalists. I was thrilled to be invited to introduce Leah, with whom I have yet to meet, but have greatly admired ever since I read her first book, where she describes the ways in which, quote, racism is built into the DNA of the U.S. food system on a legacy of stolen land and stolen labor. I remember being surprised that in my 10 years of studying food systems and sustainable agriculture at the time, not once was this history part of the curriculum. In fact, this legacy could not be more evident today when food security and the cost of farmland is at an all time high. Here in Rhode Island, one in three households are food insecure with much higher rates for BIPOC neighborhoods. There's clearly still work to be done to live up to our vision where everyone has food which nourishes their body and their community. Next year, we will begin the process to renew Rhode Island's food strategy for 2030. And I invite all of you to help us ensure that in the process, we embrace Leah's call to action. Leah's contributions to the good food movement are both visionary and practical. She reminds us that food and farming can be both systems of oppression and tools for liberation. So please join me in welcoming Leah Penniman. Greetings community. It is such an honor to be with all of you for the Honors Colloquium at University of Rhode Island. My name is Leah Penniman. I'm one of the co-founders and farm director here at Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York on unceded Mohican territory. I use all pronouns and I am so honored and excited to get to talk with you tonight about the very important work of uprooting racism and seeding sovereignty in the food system. We always begin by calling in our ancestors. None of us got here by ourselves. All of us have shoulders that we stand on. And so we want to, in this moment, call to mind um, who are those people in your lineage who helped to fortify your connection to land and social justice? Uh, in this case, I want to call in my grandmother, uh, she is uh, 
Brownie Lee McCullough, daughter of the Great Migration, grew up on a farm outside Rock Hill, South Carolina. And even though uh, her journey took her to an urban environment, maintained the connection with land by planting a strawberry patch and keeping a crabapple tree and a vegetable garden. And that is where I first learned to garden um, is with my grandmother. So if you want to take a moment and uh, be active in the comments, in the chat, and and put down the name of an ancestor who supported you in, in fomenting your own connection to land. I also want to acknowledge uh, the people of the lands uh, that we steward. In this case, we're on territory of the Mohican Nation. Uh, these are lands that folks were forcibly removed from uh, in and around the 1800s, first to Western New York, and then forcibly removed again to Wisconsin. And it's very important to to acknowledge and understand whose land we're on. And I invite you also to use the chat to, to share that with the community. Um, but it doesn't stop there. It, it, solidarity, rematriation, land back, these are very, very important acts of solidarity um, and acts of justice. And in our case at Soul Fire Farm, we've been working hard on rematriation of seeds, on cultural respect easements and other land back strategies. Uh, voluntary remittance of um, land tax and working on political campaigns to disrupt pipelines and and other projects that would desecrate sacred lands and you know the third shout out acknowledgement i want to give before we jump into our storytelling is is to our respective teams and families it is a deep privilege to get to step back and take time to talk about think about dive into big issues and this isn't possible without folks holding down the necessary work of life you know whoever is is watching the babies washing the dishes feeding the chickens you know and so i want to shout out the soul fire team and the broader black and brown uh, farming community this is a picture of the northeast farmers of color land trust gathering um sometime back and and want to just thank all of us for the ways that we support one another and act in solidarity so that we can be here together and I want to start with um, this really powerful, beautiful painting that my woman soul sister Naima Peniman created. It's called Foresight. And it captures the time period when our ancestral grandmothers were braiding seeds into their hair uh, before being forced onto transatlantic slave ships. They believed against odds in a future of, of tilling the soil, and they believed that we, their descendants, would exist to inherit the seed. So uh, here is black eyed pea being braided, and we know that uh, other African crops came with our enslaved ancestors, the black rice, the pale argonium, the coffee, the palm, eggplant, melon, and many more. But it's important to recognize it wasn't just the seed, the physical seed that came with our ancestors. There were a number of ecological and communitarian practices about right relationship with lands and each other that came too. Um, whether we want to talk about uh, composting, you know, African dark earth is this super rich pyrogenic compost, carbon capture and compost that uh, women created in Liberia and Ghana. And you could tell the age of a community by the depth of this compost. Uh, so religious was the adherence to creating it. You know, whether we talk about polycultures and, and other technologies that have been rebranded as permaculture or irrigation systems, rotational grazing, uh, terracing, soil testing, uh, using our five senses, raised beds, collective work parties, credit unions. These are Afro-Indigenous technologies uh, Afro-Indigenous technologies that came with our ancestors. And as I'm sure you know, you know, when they arrived here in the colonies and later in the United States, the system of relating to land and food and one another uh, did not resemble the Afro-Indigenous systems that they had uh, in their hearts and in their braids. Um, the system here in what would become the United States, it was was and is very replete with oppression, uh, with division, with concentration of wealth uh, in the hands of a few at the expense of the many. And no matter where you look, whether it's lands, labor, ecology, capital, food, uh, we see racial injustice uh, deep, deep in the food system. And I would argue that, you know, the very DNA of our food system is stolen land and exploited labor. If you picture a double helix with its two strands, uh, the, the theft of land and the theft of labor uh, would be those, those complementary strands. And so let's take a journey through history to understand why I would say that and also what Soulfire and other uh, black and brown led food and farm projects are doing to try to heal uh, from that history and make things right. 
So this painting, um, you may recognize, it's, it's a pretty famous painting, uh, represents the concept of manifest destiny, this idea that white Christian settlers have a God-given right to take all the land, to displace indigenous people and the buffalo. And this concept is encoded in U.S property law, um, even before the United States, with the uh, doctrine of discovery coming out of the Catholic Church in the 1400s, white Christians were encouraged uh, to go forth and colonize and enslave uh, non-Christian peoples and to take their land. And in Supreme Court cases throughout the generations, including the famous Macintosh case of 1823, this idea of doctrine of discovery was upheld, uh, most recently upheld in 2005 when the Oneida Nation tried to get back some of its stolen land and were told that indigenous people are domestic dependents and no longer have rights once the white Christians put down their flag. So stolen land, uh, one, one side of that helix, right, the DNA of the food system. The other would be exploited labor. We know that the this nation's agriculture and uh, almost all of its economic systems were built on the backs of, of those in bondage. Uh, chattel slavery claimed 16 million plus people um, from the continent of Africa who were stolen for much, much more than this idea of like strong muscles or or um, those who could wield a tool, you know, agricultural experts were targeted by slavers. Uh, this was especially notable in the rice growing regions where the Mende and Wolof were expert rice growers and European colonizers wanted to grow rice in the Carolinas. They were not familiar with how to do this and so would enslave rice growers to set up the channels and dikes and um, systems of rice growing that made the Carolinas so wealthy. Uh, definitely read Judith Carney's work if you're not familiar with this history, because it's, it's very, very important to understand that our ancestors were expert agriculturalists. So over time, this, this system of stolen land and exploited labor morphed, uh, but it fundamentally didn't change. You know, in 1865, we have the end of the Civil War, the 13th Amendment, the formal end of chattel slavery. But there was a, a handy little loophole, and still is, in the um, 13th Amendment that outlaws slavery except in the case where a person is convicted of a crime. And so um, cue the black code. So southern states uh, put a whole bunch of new laws on the book that made it illegal to be black and loiter, made it illegal to be black and unemployed, and threw people into prison and then leased them back to the plantations and the railroads. This system was so prominent that it actually made up the super majority of the state budgets of Alabama and other southern states in the late 1800s. And those who were not thrown in jail and leased, um, uh, you know, leased back to the plantation often found themselves in a debt peonage system like sharecropping or tenant farming where they owed more at the end of the season than the beginning despite laboring and found themselves in such deep and inexorable poverty that uh, rare diseases of niacin deficiency like pellagra were rampant among the sharecropping community. And what's fascinating is that Despite almost unimaginable odds, you know, the yearning to own land and to have secure land tenure, um, which was expressed with fervor, you know, when, uh, when black pastors got together and met with union generals to plan reconstruction, they were asked, you know, what is it that, that is needed? And they said, and I, I quote, um, what we need are homes in the ground beneath them so that we can plant fruit trees and say to our children, these are yours. And so this yearning for land meant people working, you know, extra jobs, seven days a week, saving up over generations because no land was given. The 40 acres and a mule was a broken promise. In fact, it was the slaveholders who uh, got reparations, um, not enslaved people. And, but saved money. And by 1910, we're able to purchase almost 16 million acres of land. Um, and we'll get to what happened to that. Um, mo almost all of it is gone in large part because there was a huge backlash from the Klan, the White Citizens Council, and other white supremacist groups who drove black farmers off their land and, and stole their land and, and still hold title, their descendants hold title to it today. So this um, theft of land, this beginning of exodus, you know, of black farmers left a labor vacuum in U.S. agriculture. And the United States had not taken opportunity to question its DNA, said instead, well, which other populations can we exploit? 
uh, underpay for their labor and started guest worker programs working um, to recruit uh, Chinese, Filipino, Mexican, Central American, Caribbean workers to in the droves, hundreds of thousands every year to come and do this work. And the labor laws that protect the American worker, um, notably, you know, the sort of beautiful blossoming of progressivism in the 1930s, where we had social security and the 40 hour work week and the right to a day off in seven and overtime pay and the right to unionize and collective bargain. Um, folks who worked on farms and in food service and as domestics were excluded explicitly because they were predominantly people of color. And the Southern Democrats, that's the parties were sort of flipped in a way at that point, um, would not vote for this legislation if it benefited uh, the black community. And so to this day, we have huge gaps in the Fair La Labor Standards Act and the National Labor Relations Act that permit exploitation of uh, farm workers. And, you know, of course, not all uh, black farmers left. The Great Migration, which did um, was the, the movement of six million uh, black people from the rural south to the urban north and west. Still, the majority of black folks stayed in the south and tried to hold on. And tragically, one of the main opponents to the thrival of black farmers was the federal government itself. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is responsible for undergirding the food system in the United States, partly through grants and loans and technical assistance and support to farmers, would give these supports to white farmers, but systematically deny black farmers over the years, which led to many foreclosures, um, a lot of land loss, businesses going under. Um, the wealth just lost from the properties alone uh, was a hundred, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, bled out of the black community. And so when we look at what was happening on the other side of the great migration, where we do have a number of black community members moving to urban areas, seeking uh, a different way of, of being, you know, not being under the th thumb of Jim Crow, uh, being able to be homeowners, property owners, to earn a fair wage, the reality was that in urban areas in the North, racism just took new forms. Uh, one of these forms was redlining. Redlining began in the 1930s when the US government um, housing authority commissioned maps to be made to rank neighborhoods from the uh, best neighborhoods that banks should lend to for mortgages down to those that banks should not lend to because they were deemed uh, hazardous or undesirable. And the result was that uh, black and brown folks who'd been ghettoized into particular environments by restrictive covenants that did not allow them to live in integrated or white neighborhoods were also outlined in red and couldn't become home homeowners and so could only work with loan sharks or be tenants and, you know, part of the result of that was that, you know, uh, soldiers coming home after World War II eligible for GI Bill uh, home ownership at 0% APR were not, were not able to get these loans. And so in our area in upstate New York, you had 67,000 free mortgages given out to veterans who'd served the country and less than 100 went to non-white families. And so that brings us, you know, to where we are today. And if you think about this legacy of stolen land and exploited labor reverberating throughout history, it should be no surprise that we live in a system of food apartheid. And food apartheid is that insidious system of segregation that relegates certain people to food opulence, Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and farmers markets on the weekends, right? And other people to food scarcity, uh, KFC and McDonald's, a corner store, a liquor store, um, emergency food systems. And so we have a situation of food apartheid where uh, people of color are more likely to suffer from diet related illnesses such as hunger, heart disease, diabetes, and kidney failure, more likely to rely on the emergency food system and less likely to report food security. And when you look at farm workers today, uh, well over 80% of farm workers are people of color, predominantly Hispanic, Latine, um, Spanish speaking folks, indigenous folks um, speaking indigenous languages. And 
Uh, yet less than 2% of farms are managed by this population, making farming uh, among the most, um, farming among the brownest professions and being a farm manager or owner among the whitest professions. And farm workers still are not guaranteed at a federal level to a minimum wage if they work on a small farm, to a day off in seven, to overtime pay, um, sick leave, collective bargaining, or other protections and pesticide exposure, wage theft, inadequate uh, safety measures. And we saw this, especially during COVID, the inadequate protections are rampant. And you could argue, and I would argue that growing the food for this nation is, is one of, if not the most important profession, and yet it's one of the least protected professions. When you look at land ownership today, almost all the lands, 98% of the agricultural land by value, 95% by acreage is white owned. Um, this is not by accident. This is a legacy of theft of land, of forcing people off of their land, of restrictive covenants that uh, force communities into small areas and, and, and credit um, disparities in access to credit and so on. And the way that we treat those closest to the earth, the farmers, the farm workers, is mirrored and amplified in the way we treat the earth herself. Uh, farming is among the most destructive activities we do on an environmental basis. Uh, it is a leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions, of biodiversity loss, of water withdrawals, and um, land use conversion. And during COVID, a time when we were all an ant and when we continue to be very focused on our right to breathe, we see um, the farm workers, uh, the food workers at excessive risk and the communities under food apartheid also at excessive risk. And so these vulnerable times in our nation lay bare the dysfunctions and the inequities in a way that we hope cannot be ignored. So we are going to talk uh, quite a bit about the legacy of hope and promise and what it is that we're doing to try to make things right. But before we move into that segment of the presentation, I want to ask you to interact with each other a bit in the chat and answer these two questions. Where were your ancestors in this history that was just discussed? And how are your people connected to these past events? So take a moment now, uh, reflect on how you're connected to these stories and please share and read uh, with one another in the chat. In every generation, there were people who remembered the seeds that were braided in our ancestors' hair and the wisdom that those seeds carried. And when we decided to create Soulfire Farm, we asked ourselves, what would it be to create a farm in a community that's very much based on the legacy of those seeds. My spouse Jonah and I were living in the south end of Albany, which is a neighborhood under food apartheid. We were struggling to get uh, access to fresh food for our precious family. Uh, there were no supermarkets, no available community garden plots, uh, no farmer's market in the neighborhood, not even public transportation to get to food outlets. And so the solution that we found was to overpay for a CSA share and to walk um, two miles to the pickup point and kind of pile the vegetables onto the kiddos in the stroller and, and go back to our apartment. So our neighbors who were similarly challenged to find fresh whole foods were, um, when they found out that we both had a history of farming and, and knew how to farm, they started asking us, you know, when are you gonna create the farm for the people? And that's how the idea was born. But it was very important to us to build on the legacy of these remembers. So here are two such remembers. We have Dr. George Washington Carver on the left, arguably one of the founders of the modern regenerative and organic movement. He was a professor at Tuskegee University in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He was also a deeply spiritual person and a profound inventor. I think I lost track at how many thousands of patents he had, how many species of fungus he discovered. But what the contribution we wanna focus on now is his understanding that soil was alive and soil deserved respect. And so he developed strategies for crop rotation, planting leguminous cover crops, uh, building compost piles, mulching, and other soil care strategies, believing, as he said, that an unkindness 
done to anything was an injustice done to that thing, a sentiment that applied to soil. Another professor at Tuskegee University, Booker T. Watley, is one of the founders of the Farm to Table movement, including the CSA or Community Supported Agriculture, Pick Your Own, uh, newsletters, and direct to consumer marketing. So at our farm, Soul Fire Farm, which was founded in 2010, we work to implement these regenerative practices that were piloted and refined by Dr. George Washington Carver. We have our semi-permanent raised beds, our heavy mulches, our attention to organic matter, uh, heritage varieties, polycultures, and so on. And it has made a difference. You can see in my left hand, the soils that we found when we first wedded ourselves to this land, even before the farm opened, you know, we signed papers back in 2006 and you couldn't get a shovel into the soil. It was hard pan clay. The topsoil was almost eroded away. So we were at subsoil and through over a decade of remediation using our heritage practices, you can see in my right hand, the soil today, which is a rich black, beautifully fragrant humus that grows wonderful vegetables, despite the naysayers who said it's not possible to farm in the mountains of Grafton uh, when we first started. And these same sustainable technologies that we apply to our crops, we also apply to our buildings. Uh, we use, we've built all of the structures here. We use cluster development, uh, sustainable local materials, energy efficiency. Um, this is our most recently completed building when it was still in progress, the beautiful sanctuary, which is a reciprocal roof timber frame um, built by our, our awesome site team. So carrying on, we when we think about remembers, we need to think about the Black Panther Party, who a lot of folks don't know among the many important contributions they made to our nation. One of the things they did was set up survival programs that provided the community with basic needs. And at this one here, uh, this picture is of the free breakfast program, which fed 20,000 children meals every single day. And in the spirit of a survival program, we want to always at our foundation, make sure that we're supporting the, the basic needs, the stated needs of our community. And one of the ways we do that is through our Solidarity Share CSA. Solidarity Shares provide no cost doorstep delivery to survivors of food apartheid in Albany and Troy, especially folks in the refugee community, folks coming home from incarceration and other people who are survivors of state violence. And so during the season, this delicious box of food arrives and um, people don't have to worry about paying market value. They can donate if they wish, um, but we do fundraising to cover the cost of those boxes. Also among the remembers, we have to go back to Tuskegee University and talk about their amazing educational programs. They realized that it was just not feasible for everyone to make it all the way out to the university. And so they put they brought the university to the people, uh, first with a mule and a cart, later they up, upgraded to this Jessup wagon, but they would go out into the rural counties and find the most dilapidated farm, um, and fix it up. They gave it an extreme farm makeover. They fixed the fences, nursed the animals back to health, prune the trees, planted cover crops, and that would become the demonstration site for the whole county to come check out and learn these sustainable technologies. And so in that spirit of each one teach one, we are running a plethora of educational programs ranging from one day um, hands on the land experiences, uh, and one day specialty workshops like on how to grow mushrooms or keep bees to our flagship week long fire immersion stands for farming in relationship with earth where people do 50 hours of training from seed to harvest and learn a lot about the history of black farming and culture of black farming as well. Um, to our 18 month fellowship. This is a very exciting newer program. It's in its second year braiding seeds fellowship, which supports professional farmers in the first 18 months of starting their business with a stipend and a mentor. And we also offer a special certificate in hanging onions while looking extremely fly. You can see a picture on the left of that. Um, sign up <laughs> after the presentation. And we work with young people as well. We have youth immersion, uh, we have youth visits and are very invested in supporting the rising generation of black and brown farmers. Uh, one of the programs near and dear to my heart is our urban educational program. A lot of the people receiving our food through Solidarity Share started saying, well, I want to grow my own food. Like, how you can you help me out with that? And so we started Soul Fire in the City, which 
provides raised beds and compost, soil, uh, plant seeds, and technical assistance for urban gardeners, both for their homes, but also community gardens. And so we have about 50 gardens in the program right now. And this extends beyond borders. Uh, we are so excited to be in relationship with sibling farms in Haiti, in Vieques, in Ghana, um, and to be learning in the spirit of intercambio and of exchange with these farmers, being able to fundraise, do volunteer delegation, and support these wonderful farmers in caring for the earth and also learning so much from them. Um, this is the Mango Growers Association in Haiti, uh, which is my maternal ancestral homeland and a place where we did uh, seven years worth of solidarity work from starting with the earthquake or the year after the um, 2010 earthquake. Also among the rememberers are these amazing institution builders. We need to shout out Fannie Lou Hamer, who my all time favorite uh, thing that, that she has uttered that I know about. She said, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, no one can push you around or tell you what to say or do. Um, she recognized that sharecroppers were being kicked off their land for having the audacity to register to vote. And so she got some land and decided to form a cooperative called Freedom Farm so that sharecroppers could collectively own their land and have security. Um, in a similar vein, New Communities Land Trust was formed of former sharecroppers and civil rights organizers in Albany, Georgia. They owned almost 6,000 acres together. It was the largest black land holding in history at that time. And it was the first community land trust. So co-ops, land trust, these incredible institutions of collective wealth have been uh, very important among our rememberers. And so in that spirit, we were one of the founding farms for the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, which works across New England, including in Rhode Island um, and upstate New York on rematriation of land and permanent secure land tenure for black and brown farmers. Um, they're doing awesome work. Definitely check out NEFOC if you don't already know about them. And we also support our alumni and fellows in creating their own business, uh, community business structures, whether that be co-ops, you know, um, nonprofit organizations, land trusts, we're supporting our alumni all across the nation and some internationally in setting up accountable structures. And one of the strategies for this that we're so excited about is this idea of people to people reparations. And I'll asterisk by saying like, we are not letting the government off the hook. We totally believe in the UN definition of five, the five points of reparations and we will fight for it. And it's gonna take some time, right? So in the meantime, how do we think about redistribution of wealth to those who have um, been robbed of it generationally, right? Because we're talking about hundreds of years of stolen land and exploited labor. That's a pretty big tab. You know, Yes Magazine has calculated that at something like $40 um, trillion, you know, so it's a big tab. And that wealth is still held. Uh, a, a white child who's born in the United States today is at least 16 times wealthier on average when they take their first breath compared to a black child. And so that wealth has been passed down, it is still um, unfairly distributed. And so we need a redistribution of land and wealth in order to have an equitable society. And the reparations map provides one small opportunity to do that, where folks can go on the map, find a project near them, uh, reach out and find ways to support in, in redistribution of resources. In terms of remembers, we also want to uplift our organizers. We want to uplift the um, civil rights movement organizers and the farmers that supported them. You know, some of my mentors have told me there would be no civil rights movement without black farmers because black farmers provided the lodging, the meeting space, the arms protection, the bail money, um, and the support for all the organizers who were coming down for Freedom Summer and beyond who obviously would not be welcomed at the Hilton uh, or the local cafe in order to do their meetings and in order to stay. Um, so we wanna shout out the organizers there also in Haiti, um, and internationally who are part of the peasant movement and, and part of Via Campesina. In the case of the peasant movement in Haiti, they resisted a Monsanto donation of GMO and hybrid seeds that threatened to undermine their local seed saving, burning the uh, donation at the port and insisting that they would continue to have their sovereignty. Um, similarly, with the work of the Immokalee workers um, and the work of uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and Larry Itliang and United Farm Workers that, that very much inspired many uh, current labor struggles. And so as we think about these organizers, we also need to be participating as change makers 
in the in the field and looking at policy and looking at at structures and how do we make things fair and so we are a member of the national black food and justice alliance we're also a member of the heal food alliance and a number of other collaborations and partnerships where we can have a say and and have had a say in the green new deal um, in the justice for black farmers act in the breathe act um, and as well as at the state and local level when it comes to policy and finally, I want to shout out some of the remembers who are closest to my heart because I know them personally. And these are the Queen Mothers of Ghana. I had the privilege as a young person to go and study with them for six months, learning about farming and culture and history. And among the many things they taught me um, can be encapsulated in this, this story. They said, you know, Leah, is it true that in, in the United States, most farmers will put a seed in the soil and they won't sing or dance or pray or pour libations or even say thank you to the earth and then they expect that seed to grow and when i admitted this was true they said well that's why you're all sick right you're all sick because you treat the earth as as a thing and not as a relative and in the spirit of that lesson of kinship of ecological humility of the idea that the grass the trees the sky the mountains the eagles those are our elder siblings to whom we owe deference we have tried to reinfuse our lives at the farm with libations, with song, dance, praise, thanks, asking permission before we make major changes um, to the land. And we do believe that in order to get free as people, the land and our beyond human kin also need to be free. The good news with all of this is that there are so many ways to contribute to healing the very, very exploitative and dangerous food system that has relied on stolen land and exploited labor. And all of us are obligated, right? We all eat food. I would say pretty much all of us live somewhere on lands unless you, you know, riding around on a boat. And, um, and so therefore we are part, right? And there are so many ways to get involved. Um, this is a butterfly of transformative social justice. I love this image and shout out to my daughter Nishima for the graphic design. Uh, Nishima is a student at Brown University, very close to you all, uh, but designed this while uh, they were in high school. So um, what I love about this graphic is that the butterfly can't fly with one or two or three of its winglets it needs all four and in that same way our work for social justice land and food sovereignty requires all four strategies resist is one that's the direct confrontation of oppression the litigation boycott civil disobedience marches walkouts work strikes right we also need the reformers, the people with the audacity and courage to go on the inside, to run for office, to work in the school system, to try to transform institutions from the inside out. Um, we need the builders, those of us who create alternative institutions that try to model the society that we hope to live in. Our land trust, freedom schools, mutual aid and lending societies, community clinics and people's assemblies. And the healers, there is no way we can go through hundreds of years of this type of oppression and racial violence and not be harmed. And so we need ritual, therapy, ceremony, art, community building, prayer, and a focus on making ourselves whole so that when we get to where we're going, we're not replicating the same structures that we learned while under an oppressive system. And the other good news is there are so many folks who are already doing this work. So many folks, a lot of times there can be a misnomer that, you know, black and brown people just aren't interested in the land or the environment or their hearts are fine, but folks are everywhere and oftentimes under-resourced and under-appreciated. Um, there are so many grassroots leaders that deserve support. Folks like Safon, the Katza Farm Worker Community, Black Urban Growers, Black Farmer Fund of New York, NEFOC, the Black Church Food Security Network, um, and many more. And actually, if you go to our website, soulfirefarm.org, you can find a complete, or not a complete, a more comprehensive list of some of these grassroots organizations. But in all cases, when we talk about healing racial injustice, we need to make sure that the power, the resources, and the dignity are given over to those most impacted by the problem, making sure that we support the leadership of black and brown communities of farm workers and land keepers as we chart the way forward 
So you can check out more um, action steps and ideas for how to get involved at soulfirefarm.org slash take action. And before we close, I want to share with you um, this very, very powerful passage uh, by ancestor Toni Morrison from the Song of Solomon that is something we read to each other as we begin each of our farmer training programs. Um, so here we go. See, see what you can do. Never mind you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind you born a slave. Never mind you lose your name. Never mind your daddy dead. Never mind nothing. Here, this here is what a person can do if they put their mind to it and their back in it. Stop sniveling, the land said. Stop picking around the edges of the world. Take advantage, and if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here on this planet, in this nation, in this country right here, nowhere else. We got a home in this rock, don't you see? Nobody starving in my home, nobody crying in my home, and if I got a home, you got one too. Grab it, grab this land, take it, hold it, my brothers, make it, my sisters, shake it, my siblings, squeeze it, turn it, twist it, beat it, kick it, kiss it, whip it, stomp it, dig it, plow it, seed it, reap it, rent it, buy it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass it on. Can you hear me? Pass it on. Thank you so much for this beautiful time together. And I look forward to engaging with your questions.